Um, we are in a series in 1 Thessalonians. So if you're with us for the first time today, we're going to crack open our Bibles. Uh, if you're with us for the thousandth time today, we're still cracking open our Bibles. 1 Thess- Thessalonians chapter 3 is where we will be today. Years ago, I was uh, listening to a, a discussion with one of the great Christian scholars, a man by the name of J.P. Moreland. J.P. Moreland is a professor of philosophy at Biola University. Uh, He was also, I think, a professor of philosophy at Southern California University at the time that I was listening to this. And he was was engaged in this discussion, kind of a QA, and a with a whole host of college students. I was very impressed with the, the whole discussion and how genial this brilliant man was in fielding these questions with college students. Some of them were uh, really questioning the faith, maybe some coming from a Christian backdrop, really questioning what they believed. There were others in the midst of that that were clearly antagonistic toward Christianity, but still like searching. And then there were other people who maybe were not really searching for anything, but like just trying to put on a display of how much they know about how stupid Christianity is. And so it came across like that. I was really struck by how deeply J.P. Moreland, this brilliant man, clearly cared for these students in the way that he addressed them. But there was a little change of pace when it came to one particular student. One student jumped up, and his intention was clearly just to mock Christianity. He was just there to sort of rip on Christianity as a whole. And while J.P. Moreland had been very patient, very kind, very genial with the other students, When this young man got up to speak, he began to wax eloquent and was very snide and derisive, you know what I mean? And as he's doing that, J.P. Moreland just kind of stopped him and he's like, why should I find your questions interesting? What an interesting way to respond. Why should I find your questions interesting? Now, I know enough about J.P. Moreland to know that he could have embarrassed that student. He could have made that student feel completely stupid and foolish for the way he was talking. What he was saying was just ridiculously easy to overwhelm. But instead, he just put the question back to the questioner. And the question was essentially this, why should I find anything you're saying interesting at all or worthy of my time? It was almost an expression that J.P. Moreland didn't really care about what the young young man was saying. Now, at first, when I heard this, I thought, there's something very wrong here, isn't there? I mean, aren't we as Christians just obliged to show sort of a blanket concern and compassion for every person, no matter where they are in their spiritual walk or where they are in ridiculing us? But as I've matured in the faith and knowledge of the word, I've noticed this. There is not an injunction for universal concern for human beings. Say that again. We're not called to have the same level of concern for every human being that exists. Or perhaps we might think of it this way. The concern that we're called to show is somewhat selective in object and application. The godliest people in this world, including Christ Jesus himself, care deeply about many people, most people. In fact, I could say all people, but they are very dismissive of a certain kind of person. Have you heard the biblical injunction, don't cast your pearls before swine? How about this one? Knock the dust off your feet and move on from that place. These are commands to drop concern for a certain type of person and move on. And if you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound very nice. Well, let's think about your own relationship with your own children. Let's imagine you have a child in your house and your child comes home crying because they were ridiculed by somebody on the playground, just mocked relentlessly. You say to your child, well, honey, you should probably value their appraisal. It seems to me that perhaps you are, in fact, a duty head. Or would you be more inclined to direct their attention to the fact that there are some people whose opinions you shouldn't be that concerned about? There are some individuals who are out there, and what they think really doesn't matter that much because what they think is terribly wrong. This week, we're going to begin examining the role of concern in the life of a disciple. Concern. Now, as a disciple, most of you might not be familiar with the term disciple. Hopefully, those of you who've been here for a while are very familiar with the term disciple. The term disciple, mathetes in Greek, means learner or student. And the idea is, if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a student or a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ, a disciple. Now, When we talk about disciples and concern of disciples and from disciples, 
we're going to here be expressly looking at how we express love in the form of spiritual discipline. We're going to be thinking about who is worthy of our concern, and we're going to ask the question, how precisely do we express concern as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul and the church of Thessalonica had a mutual concern for one another that gives us a great pattern for applying to our own lives. Before we dig in heavy on this, let's go ahead and pray. Our Lord and our God, Father, as we do every week, as we open up your word and begin studying, I pray for understanding. I pray that you would direct us. I pray that you would speak to the inner man of every person in this room, that we would know your will, know your designs on our life. Father, wherever we are outside of your will, I pray that you would make that evident. We want to follow you. We want to know you more, Lord. Be with us this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to start today by talking about disciples' care. Secondarily, we're going to talk about concern with regard to the issue of affliction. And lastly today, we're going to talk about being encouraged by concern. The word of the day is concern. Everyone say concern. Now, when you hear concern, some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm concerned about tons of things, by which you might be thinking worry and anxiety. That is not what we're going to be talking about today. Worry and anxiety, according to the scriptures, are sin. So when we're talking about concern today and a righteous concern, what we're thinking about there is, we might express it this way, just like investment or care for people. Make sense? Concern, investment, care. We're not always good at showing where we care or how much we care, but we've got lots of ways to communicate that we don't care. While researching my sermon for this past week, I actually ran across a list of alternative ways to tell somebody that you don't care. Here's one. If caring is a crime, I plead not guilty. Or how about this one? I'm all out of cares. I must have left them in my other pants. If caring were a sport, I'd definitely be sitting the bench right now. Or I'd pretend to care about this, but I'm really a terrible actor. How about this one? I'm going to move that to the very top of my totally irrelevant list. Now, clever phrases are not necessary in order to demonstrate that you don't care. If you want to show that you don't care, all you have to do is nothing. You've been in conversations with people when you realize they're done with the conversation before, right? You're talking to the person, and pretty soon their eyes are kind of wandering, and then maybe they're like just not even looking at you. You can tell maybe they're thinking about what else they're going to say. Or maybe they're thinking about what they're going to eat for lunch. Maybe they visibly begin distancing themselves from you, but they're expressing, I don't care. We know what lack of concern looks like. But what does godly concern look like? Now, before we get started in chapter three today, I just want to bring you up to speed as to where we've been so far in this series. Quick reminder on what we've seen with the emergence of the Thessalonian church, the one that Paul's writing this letter to. The Thessalonian church, you'll remember, Paul showed up here for the first time. And when he showed up, how did he look, folks? Thoroughly beaten. All right? He had just come from torture in Philippi. And we mean literal torture. He was bludgeoned with, with rods in front of the uh, public sphere. He was put in stocks, probably had the bottoms of his feet beaten in that condition. And so he's black and blue, possibly missing teeth, certainly still bearing the wounds of having been in Philippi and being tortured. That's how he shows up to this group of people in Thessalonica. And then he begins going to the synagogues in Thessalonica, and he's teaching. And week by week, over the course of three weeks, they get this influx of people who are like, I want to follow Jesus Christ. This is the emergence of the church in Thessalonica. Now, we saw in chapter one that Paul congratulates them. He's writing this letter, and he's congratulating them after he has had to flee the city because of a riot. He's congratulating them on maintaining their faith. He's congratulating them on all they're doing and the fact that other believers around the region, different churches in all these different places are talking about the faith of the Thessalonians. He then talks about their discipleship experience, right? That we've developed you, we've brought you along in a life-to-life fashion. We see that in chapter two. We see also in chapter two that Paul defends his reputation for them, or with them. He says, look, you know, I was clearly not after money while I was with you guys. I didn't take a dime from anybody. I worked the whole time I was with you to make sure I supplied all my own needs. So you know I wasn't after your money. I just came for gospel in pursuit of the gospel. 
He then describes his relationship with them as a father with a child. And this is clearly how Paul thinks about the church at Thessalonica. Paul discusses the bond they shared through devotion to the word of God and how that bond was evident even in persecution, even as these people in Thessalonica were being attacked by their peers. Paul's saying it's evident that we share commonality in that regard. This brings us up to chapter three. Let's begin with this question. Is Paul a caring person? Is the apostle Paul a caring person? Well, I mean, he clearly cares about the churches he's planting, right? He cares deeply about his fellow Jews. In fact, Paul says, I'd be willing to forfeit my own salvation if the Jewish people would be restored to faith. Paul also cares about the Gentiles that he's ministering to coming to faith. He cares about his fellow workers, and he definitely cares about good doctrine, about making sure what he's teaching is coherent and in line with what Christ taught. So here's a bigger question. What doesn't Paul care about? You learn a lot about somebody when you see what they don't care about. And the things Paul doesn't care about are things that are probably central for most human beings you've ever met, including you. Paul, for instance, doesn't seem to care whether he lives or dies. Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't know which I should prefer of the two. In other words, my life doesn't matter whether I'm alive. It doesn't matter whether I'm dead. Now, for most human beings, living and dying is a pretty big distinction. Like, people seem a little bit concerned with whether or not they're alive or dead. For Paul, not a big deal. Paul seems unconcerned about how much stuff he's got. Philippians chapter 4, Paul talks about being content in all circumstances. He's like, I go without food sometimes. Sometimes I've well fed. Sometimes I've got a lot. Sometimes I've got just a little. I don't really care about stuff. What are most of the people in the world out there living for? Stuff. Got to get more stuff. Got to get a bigger house to put more stuff in, right? Paul doesn't seem to care about people who've blown off the gospel. In every town Paul goes to, he's making presentations. He's telling people about Jesus. And when people show complete disinterest, Paul returns the favor. Not chasing that down any further. Paul doesn't seem to care much about pleasing authorities that he doesn't see as valid. Or when he sees authorities as opposing the plan of God, he's not working to try to gain their affections. He's not trying to win favor from power brokers. Paul only seems to care about his own reputation insofar he's, as he's not being tarnished by lies. You'll notice last week, we talked just a few weeks ago about Paul defending his reputation for hard work, but he just did that in order to keep people from directly lying about him. Paul will tear himself down all the time throughout the Gospels. Have you noticed that? Or in, in, throughout the epistles, rather. Paul will say things like, I'm chief of all sinners. He's clearly not trying to build up a legacy for himself. Paul cares little to nothing about money except for how it can be used for God's people and kingdom purposes. Paul cares little for comfort or security provided by a base of operations. He's on the move throughout most of his adult life. He doesn't seem bent on settling down or raising a family. In fact, he's set aside marriage so that he can better serve God. Now, he's not down on marriage. He loves the institution of marriage. He directs a lot of attention to husbands and wives and their roles. He directs a lot of attention to children and their roles. Most of what humans place their highest value in, Paul seems unconcerned with. Isn't that interesting? Wealth, prosperity, legacy, family, stability, reputation, power, influence, all those things, he's just like, meh. What's the common thread in Paul's concern then? Paul is concerned for the disciples the potential disciples of Christ. He's concerned about the church and their well-being. He's concerned about sound doctrine. Listen to Paul describe his life. This is fascinating. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 29. This is, this is kind of a what I have been through discussion. He says, in the face of more labor, or in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And when he says stoned there, he means the type where they throw rocks, not the other kind. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had been like hanging on to flotsam out in the middle of ocean for a night and a day, I think that's like the only thing I would ever talk about. Like that would come up in like every conversation. 
A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. That's a serious list of things he's gone through. But listen to what he says in verse 28. Apart from such external things, in other words, almost as if to blow off all that other stuff, apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? Paul is invested in other Christians. He cares deeply about people who are part of the church. A manifestation of this concern is evident in our text today. Let's begin by looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. You remember at the end of chapter 2, Paul was saying, I really wanted to come see you guys in Thessalonica. I greatly desire to see your faces, but I was prevented by Satan. And we said explicitly, he's probably talking about a whole set of circumstances that kept him from traveling to them. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. There's no means of quick communication in this day and age. Can't get a text from somebody, can't even get an email, can't even get snail mail. None of that stuff is being passed along. And so Paul has heard a few things about the Thessalonians. He's heard, hey, they're excelling in their faith. But then he's also heard things about them being persecuted and experiencing great difficulty. To put some flesh on this, put some skin on it. I want you to imagine you've got like, you got a a son and a daughter. And they're getting up to about college age. And they've been great kids. Like the whole of their lives is they're coming up. They're like great kids in your house. And you just, you don't just love them, but you love their friends too. And you've like had their friends around the dinner table and you've laughed together and talked together. You love this whole group. And this whole group decides we're going all out of state to the same school. And so they travel out of state. They go to the same college. Then you start hearing things from them. Well, about them. So you see something on the news about them. They're making waves in the college of that. Straight A students. Oh, wonderful. And you hear that they're like leading all these campus organizations. Like, that's my boy. That's my girl. But then you start hearing other things. You hear a report that your son was dragged out of a classroom by a college professor and an angry mob, and they beat him publicly. And then you you hear that one of his friends tried to step in and defend him, and now that friend is in prison and does not seem to seem like he's going to get out of prison. And maybe you hear nothing from your daughter. For weeks and weeks, you hear nothing. And so think of the heart of a parent here. You'd be going like, what's going on with my kids? And you'd be freaking out, just wondering what was transpiring with them. This is Paul's condition with the church of Thessalonica. He's heard good reports. He's heard tons of bad reports. And he just wants to know where they're at. Here's our first application of genuine concern. Genuine, godly concern costs something. Genuine concern costs something. The most evident way to show concern is to show up. And so what happens here? Somebody's got to show up to the Thessalonians and see what's going on. And that's going to cost Paul on this mission. They were in Athens. They're entrenched in ministry. And he's going to take one of his number, like a core member of his group, And he's going to send him away so that he can go to Thessalonica and see what people are doing. Genuine concern costs something. If you have concern and you do nothing with it, if all it is is an emotion in you, it is utterly worthless. Concern that does nothing and costs nothing is nothing. Genuine concern should cost something. So Paul sends along a delegate. He delegates compassion in the person of Timothy. Let's talk about Timothy. You guys have probably all heard the name Timothy in the scriptures, right? Do you know who the young man is? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Let's hear Timothy's origin story. So Timothy is from a region known as Lystra. He probably came to follow the Lord Jesus Christ when Paul made a missionary trip to Lystra back in 46 AD. So years before, in Paul's first missionary journey, it's likely that that's the point he decided to follow Jesus. Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. 
As such, he was likely targeted, racially speaking, to some degree, likely ostracized in particular by the Jewish community. Timothy paid a serious price right at the outset of his ministry to serve the Lord God. Look at Acts chapter 16, 1 through 3. Now Paul traveled to Derbe and also to Lystra. A disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer in Christ. However, his father was a Greek. Timothy was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him as a missionary, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were there in, the, in that, those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, I'm not sure how much converting to Christianity cost you. But with respect to Timothy, he had to make a rather substantial sacrifice right out of the gate. You can tell that Timothy is all in. He's committed. Timothy was trained in knowledge of God by whom? Do you know? We might say Paul. But before he ever heard from Paul, we know from the scriptures who Timothy's most profound mentors were. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul's talking to Timothy here. He says, I remember your sincere and unqualified faith, the surrendering of your entire self to God in Christ with confident trust in his power, which first lived in the heart of your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am confident that it is in you as well. Where did the impact in Timothy's life begin? With his mother and his grandmother. Quick word of encouragement and application to the moms in this room. I know sometimes when you are cleaning up for the billionth time after that kid, you're like, this is such a waste of time. The faith you instill in your children by words and by example can have ripple effects that alter cosmic history. Please hear what I'm saying there. I'm not just saying the history of your child. I'm saying cosmic history. I'm saying eternal ramifications. When you plant seeds in your children, that grow up and produce fruit. That fruit can then plant seeds, which grow up and produces fruit, which can then be planted on and on into eternity, such that a multitude may be in heaven as a result of your faithfulness in your homes right now. Timothy's on mission here. Timothy first met Paul possibly as a teenager. We know that he was considered at least relatively young in the condition he was in. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says, don't let, let anybody look down on you because of your youth. Uh, and youth can mean, for the Jew, Jewish context here, the youth can mean someone between the ages of 13 to 40. So youth is fairly relative with them. Uh, but at, at any rate, don't let people look down on you because of your youth. You're making an impact for the kingdom wherever you are. In addition to serving alongside Paul as a men, uh, missionary, Timothy served at least five churches that we know of leading those churches. We see that he is discipling and training the Thessalonians here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We see that he's working with the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 4. The Berean church we read about in Acts chapter 17. The Ephesian church we read about in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. The Macedonian church in Acts chapter 19 verse 22. And it seems likely that he probably also ministered in Philippi. That's a lot of churches. That's a lot of leadership and a lot of churches. And if you want to get a sense of the quality of who Timothy was, listen to how Paul describes him in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. Paul says this, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that you may also be encouraged, or so that I may also be encouraged by learning news about you. For I have no one else like him who is so kindred a spirit who will be genuinely concerned for your spiritual welfare. Paul's like, I've got nobody like Timothy. Timothy is the best. Now, what's interesting about this letter to the Philippian church is that this comes well after Paul sending Timothy to the Thessalonian church. It seems likely that what we're reading about today in Thessalonians became a pattern for most of the rest of Paul's ministry, where he would convert a congregation, they would bring a church in, he'd develop them, then he'd move on to go start another church somewhere. And then he'd send Timothy back to that church to help build them up and continue to disciple them and straighten out their theology and make sure they're on the right course. I'm going to briefly mention Timothy's finish line just to give you a flavor of who this guy is. According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, Timothy died while in his 80s. 
Apparently, he was leading the church in Ephesus at the time. And uh, there was a, you know, you know how as you get older, you kind of lose your internal monologue and you just start saying things? You know what I'm talking about, right? All right. Well, so Timothy's in his 80s at that stage of the game, and he's been leading the church for a long time. And there's a public procession of, like a pagan procession, probably entailed a whole lot of things that we would consider very crass. And Timothy just goes out in public and he's like, this idolatrous stupidity is just utter nonsense. And the crowd turned on him and beat him to death. Timothy was young blood. Here's a second way that we see concern actualized in the life of believers. Wise concern, genuinely caring concern, plans for the future of the church. Perhaps the hardest component of leadership is letting go of the reins and passing them off to someone you feel is not ready. And Timothy probably occupied that position when Paul first started dealing with him here. Remember, Paul said, I wanted to come to you, but Satan prevented me. And you might look at that and be like, what a defeat. I mean, Satan prevented, but look what the pre- prevention that Satan put into play brought about. Timothy was sent. And Timothy needed to cut his teeth with ministry and do better. This is why something like VBS is so important and why I'm so glad to be part of a church that invests heavily in our teenagers and our young people and our college students. Because it's not just that they're the future of the church later. They're the present church today, and part of what we have to be doing is developing leadership qualities in them now so that they can lead now. Paul brings Timothy on in this way. He's young blood in the church. He has developed leadership. Paul cares enough to deprive his mission in Athens of Timothy, and Timothy cares enough to show up in Thessalonica. Disciples care. Let's talk about afflictions. We'll change gears a bit here as we talk about concern as it relates to affliction. I want you to think of the greatest human beings who've ever lived. Try to get a few of them in mind. The greatest statesmen, the greatest leaders, the greatest thinkers, the most clever, the most creative, but particularly think of the most wise human beings you have ever known of or heard of. Would you say that they had an easy life? Were they comfortable and safe all of their days? Or was it the case that their greatness was forged in times of difficulty and affliction? You don't get a Winston Churchill without an Adolf Hitler. Think about your own trials. Think about the rough things you've been going through or gone through in life. Think about those patches of difficulty and ask yourself this, have I become a different person as a result of that? Did it change me? Did it challenge me? Did it deepen me? We're going to talk about afflictions here. I want to start by reading James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. This is James talking to the churches. He says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Now, we're going to, we talked last week a bit about persecution, didn't we? Persecution is when you are being attacked for being a believer from somebody who's on the outside. That's when you're being attacked specifically from your faith. But today, we want to focus in a little bit on affliction. This past week, uh, Steve Jordan sent me a C.S. Lewis quote after he and I had had a mutual conversation with some people who were uh, maybe a little bit outside of the faith, and we got to have a, a discussion with them. But here's, here's the phrase, and I love this. C.S. Lewis says, God allows us to experience the low points in life to teach us lessons that we could learn in no other way. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse 3 and 4. So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. Persecution is affliction, but affliction is not necessarily persecution. The term affliction that is used here in the Greek is thlipsis. Everyone say thlipsis. Now, that's kind of fun to say because it makes you want to spit a little bit because that TH and L sound just go together. Thlipsis. Um, Thlipsis can refer to any difficulty you're undergoing. So think of any hardship, any pressure, any burdens, trouble, or tribulation that you experience. That's affliction. Put this in plain terms here. What Paul is talking about here could be persecution, or it could be 
health issues or financial problems or social issues or joblessness. Whatever you can imagine would stress a person out or send them into spiritual crisis, that is, lipsis, affliction. Now, which is the greater threat to your faith? Being attacked by somebody for being a Christian or just being a Christian and experiencing great difficulty and not knowing why? For me, I think the greater threat to my faith, I think probably the greater threat to any faith is not so much being attacked. There's something about other people challenging us in our faith that is almost emboldening. It's like there's a little bit of fight in us, you know, a little bit of fire. And when we're attacked for what we believe, there's part of us that's just like, yeah, I must be doing it right. But what about when things are just going terribly in life and you're left sort of head scratching as to why God would be letting these things happen to you? Most of us ask the question at that point, who is this affliction from? Why am I suffering this way? I've got concern about my suffering. Why is it happening? Is it from God? I mean, if God is all powerful, that means all things in our life are either part of God's active will. It's either he wanted it for us or permissive will. He doesn't want it for us, but he's going to allow it to happen to us anyway. When difficulties are occurring in our lives, one of our first go-to questions, and this is a prayer that many of us have offered, God, why are you letting this happen to me? God, am I being punished? God, do you not love me? God, are you, are you trying to bring harm to me? What's going on here, God? Some of that stuff we experience is just part of the fallen world. It's part of the general curse that came upon humanity. Things like illness, age, death, corruption, accidents, and the like. This is all part of the natural economy after the fall of man. But then some of us will be like, okay, well, maybe it's not God. Maybe this is from Satan. Maybe this is from the devil, like the actual adversary. Remember what Paul said last week that kept him from coming to the Thessalonian church? That it was Satan. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's talking about a thorn in his flesh, by which he means there's something happening that he really wants God to take away. And in talking about that thorn in the flesh, he says, this was a messenger of Satan to me. In other words, the devil has put a particular thing in my life. And Paul says, I've gone to God over and over on this. And I'm like, God, please remove this from me. Take this thorn from my flesh. And he says, three times God responded to me and said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. In other words, everything I've given you is enough. I want this to remain in your life for a reason. So does affliction come from Satan? Does it come from God? I want to suggest there's a third option here. Does it matter? Does it matter whether it comes from God or whether it comes from Satan? And here I'll reference you to Job. If you're not terribly biblically literate, let me bring you up to speed. The book of Job is a book in the Old Testament. It might be the oldest book in the Bible, as a matter of fact. And the book of Job is an entire book about the suffering of humanity, particularly a person, Job, who experiences great difficulty. And it's a dialogue back and forth. And you're seeing things in the spiritual realm and on earth, and you get this response from God at the end of it all. But in the midst of that, you might be asking these same questions. Is this from God? What does God want to accomplish? But you notice in the book of Job, where does Job's suffering come from? It comes from Satan by permission of God. It comes from Satan by permission of God. Now, the question we want to ask is this. Did that suffering accomplish anything? And the answer is a profound yes. The spiritual realm, the angelic principalities and majesties and demonic forces learned something from that particular engagement. Job clearly learned something and developed. Job's friends learned something and developed as human beings. And anyone who's ever read that book, I expect has walked away from that knowing more about who God is and what God wants. Pastor David Gusick suggests this. He suggests that we ought not care about the origin of affliction. What he means here is we rather ought to be concerned with the outcome of any affliction we experience. Will this serve the adversary or will this serve my master? Will this serve God? Well, how does Paul feel about affliction? Well, affliction can accomplish good things, clearly. Paul is not terribly concerned about affliction, at least as you and I would be concerned about affliction. But Paul at this moment is braced for discouragement. Have you ever braced yourself for disappointment? Gear yourself up to hear bad news I don't know, maybe you're opening a gift from a relative who is not particularly good at giving gifts. 
And so you're just getting yourself psyched up, like, okay, put on the face. Be good, be kind, smile. Oh, yeah, a fanny pack. I was just thinking I needed a fanny pack. Oh, and this one clearly is for a girl, which makes sense as to why you would be giving that to me, right? But maybe, maybe you're getting ready to eat somebody's cooking who, you know, they, they're not particularly good at cooking or making things that are actually edible for human beings. And, and so you're just kind of getting yourself worked up to be disappointed and to, to fight your way through it. I think this is where Paul is at the beginning uh, as, as he's ready to receive this message back about the Thessalonian church. For Paul, what is he most concerned about? What is the most grave outcome that Paul could see experienced here? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. What is Paul most concerned about with regard to the Thessalonian church? Paul's worst case scenario does not involve people dying. Did you notice that? He does, it, his worst case scenario is not them having their property confiscated. The thing that he's most worried about is not them falling afoul of the society they lived in. What is Paul's biggest concern? It's that they'll fall away from the faith. A quick application for your lives again here. What is your biggest concern for like your kids or your spouse? The people you know and love that surround you. Is your biggest concern for your kids that they do well in school and get great grades and that they're in all the sports and that they're really popular with their friends and that they go to college and they get a great job and make lots of money because your kid can still do that and end up in hell? What is your biggest concern for the people you love most dearly in, in this life? Paul seems to think here that biggest concern should be that they fall away from the faith. You care most about whether or not they continue to trust in God. Better to die physically than to die spiritually. Better to lose treasure on earth and keep your treasure in heaven. Better to have Christ than to have this entire world. Amen? Since the advent of modern computing and digital documents, most of us have a connected experience. An experience of digital discouragement. I'm talking about that moment where you realize that a document you spent a ton of time on and a time of energy working on is now gone. Anybody had that? Anybody felt that extraordinary pain? Either it got deleted, saved wrong, something happened, but it's all that work and nothing to show for it. I think it was last year, it might have been the year before, I had an absolute panic attack. I had three years of sermons. I went back looking for a particular thing that I said in a sermon, and all of them were gone. It was, it was so much. It takes me like 40 hours in a week to put together a sermon. It's, it takes me a long time. And I was just like, all of that work and nothing to show for it. Praise the living God. I found an old computer in my house and I'd saved it to it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I think Paul's in a condition here where he's looking at this and he's like, I'm just, I'm just all that work we did in Thessalonica, it's going to be gone. That church is going to implode. There's just going to be just a bunch of disillusioned backsliders there. These people were vulnerable, and they probably all fell away. Paul has a good reason to be concerned for this. It emerges actually explicitly from the words of Christ. So Jesus, you remember the parable of the sower? Jesus is telling this parable, and he's like, the gospel goes out, and it's like spread in all these different conditions, and he describes people as different kinds of soil. And he says there's a certain kind of soil that is shallow soil, or it's rocky soil. Listen to how it's described in Mark chapter 4. Mark 4, verse 16 and 17. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they heard the word, immediately received it with joy. And then they had no firm root in themselves, but only temporary. Then when affliction, affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fell away. Paul's right to be concerned here. Why? Because it seems clear that the Thessalonians must be shallow disciples at this point. After all, they only had three plus about three weeks of real instruction from an apostle. And then they were just turned loose to be a church. How can they have any depth? And yet, what do we find in this church? Depth. There's a word for this. The eminent professor, J.R.R. Tolkien, coined this word. I love Tolkien. And when you get smart enough, and when you, I don't know, create an entire language just for the fun of it, 
You get to make up words. And J.R.R. Tolkien is one of these individuals who has made up such a word. If you're not familiar with this word, I hope you go forth from today knowing this is now an official word in the English language. Thank you, author of Lord of the Rings. The word is eucatastrophe. Everyone say eucatastrophe. A eucatastrophe is the opposite of a catastrophe. A catastrophe is when you expect something good and are surprised by something terrible. That's a catastrophe. A eucatastrophe is when you anticipate something terrible, but are shocked and amazed to find something wonderful. There was no word in the English language for that until Tolkien made one up. You know, Christianity, Christianity is a faith of eucatastrophe. It is a faith where it looks like only the worst could come about, but then amazing things happen. And this is what we see with the Thessalonian church. We talked about righteous concern. Righteous concern looks like caring about somebody's faith life. We talked about concern with regard to affliction, caring that people are able to maintain the faith through difficulties. Let's end by talking about being encouraged by concern. As adults, we are used to providing care for our kids, aren't we? We make the meals. It's so commonplace to like clean up after them and make meals every day that it's kind of a shock when they turn around and start trying to care for us. I remember uh, years ago when my daughter Grace, who's now married and an adult, was like four years old. Um, I remember I was working out back doing something and I had like this cut on my leg or something. I'd injured myself somehow. But I was just out there kind of continuing to work and she disappeared from her swing set. And then a few minutes later, she came back with a little ice pack in her hand, right? Isn't that, yeah, it's sweet, isn't it? Isn't that awesome when, ki- when kids are like looking at you and the care you've brought to them, they begin returning to you? My son Aiden right now, he's, he's working on being an actuary and he's, he's working at Kroger's. We almost never have to shop anymore because we just call him up like, we need heavy cream, we need onions, we need, you know, and he just, he just brings the stuff home, right? But he's, it's, it's like he's returning the favor. He's caring for me now. My boys sometimes will bring me a cup of coffee. What a blessing, right? Encouraged by concern. This is Paul's experience right now. Paul is sick with anticipation of bad news from this church. But what does he find out? Not only that he cares for them, but that they care for him deeply. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us good news of your faith and love. You always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. So Timothy returns with the news that the Thessalonians are flourishing in the midst of their affliction and difficulty. They're not just surviving, they're thriving in the midst of this. But more than that, it's more than that their faith is alive. They're concerned about you, Paul. They care about your life and your spiritual walk. Paul longs to see them again. He relishes the, the, the thought of just being around them, and they are returning the favor. They delight in the thought of him. They're praying for him. They're concerned about Paul. Now, our immediate sentiment here might be something like, oh, that's nice. Everybody likes each other. That's sweet. It's more than that. This landed at just the right time. Paul needed this at this moment. Have you ever been in a place of like absolute discouragement in your life? And like you are just down in the dumps and all of a sudden a note comes in or somebody sends you a text or somebody shows up in your life and they just bring you news or love or kindness or a word of encouragement and it hits at just the right time. And it completely flips your mentality on its head. You're suddenly enthusiastic again and life is brought back into you. This is what's going on with Paul in this context. Now, you wouldn't know it directly from the text, but Paul is in a very bad way when word comes back to him from Timothy. In Timothy's timeline, you remember that Timothy left while they were in Athens. In Athens, what was going on is Paul had, Paul had gone, gone and spoken on the Areopagus. That's where all the greatest philosophers of that day met and debated things. And after Paul had spoken there, this church emerges in power, and they begin developing this church. And in the midst of that, Paul needs Timothy but he sends Timothy away to go minister to the Thessalonians. Timothy doesn't catch back up to Paul when he's in Athens. Timothy catches back up to Paul when he is in Corinth. Now, I don't know how much you know about the Corinthian church, but they had, let us say delicately, issues. The Corinthian church was rife with issues. In fact, 
In the ancient world, if you were talking about somebody over-sexualizing something, you called it Corinthianizing something. So this is the, the group that Paul is with when he's in Corinth. And if you've ever seen the behind the scenes in ministry, and you know how ugly sometimes life drama and family drama can be. And in this culture, you got a pagan culture where you've got people who are like temple prostitutes who are coming to faith. And you've got all sorts of issues. Paul's dealing with this, putting out fires at every turn. He's in Corinth experiencing this when word comes back to him. And what does it say? Your elder son, Thessalonica, is doing great. Parents in the room, don't look at your kids. Uh, have you ever had a child who are, they, they just act so poorly that you're like, am I doing this wrong? Like, am I just, a, am I a really awful parent? Like, this is where this lands for Paul. Paul's in a condition where he's, he's like, I, I, I am not being effective in the least. And word comes back from Thessalonica. I see somebody covering their eyes, not looking at their kid. It's amazing. All right. Word comes back. Hey, your kids in Thessalonica love you, and they, they're thinking about you, and they're doing great, even in the midst of their difficult circumstances. And Paul is exuberant. Look at the rest of this text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, and if you've got your Bibles there, underline distress and affliction, and in the margin write Corinth. This is the Corinthian church. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live like you breathed life back into us. If you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Paul is rejuvenated by this word he got from the Thessalonian church. Let's put feet on this really quickly as we're wrapping up today. The biggest concerns we see in this text are not for physical well-being, they're not that life is just secure and wonderful and wealth and finances are there. What is the biggest concerns that we're seeing in all this? It is one person, concern, one disciple of Christ, concerned for other disciples of Christ. It becomes the highest priority. To put feet on this, there are people that you are training in the kingdom of God right now. If you're raising children in your home, you are teaching, you're teaching them something about God one way or another. Even if, you, if, even if you hate the idea of God, you're telling your kids something. You're telling them a story right now. Care about those you have discipled. Nurture them. Be concerned with them. Pray for them. Have conversations with them. Express encouragement to them. If you're raising somebody in the kingdom of God, if you have ministered to somebody in the kingdom of God, here's a good idea. If you have been instrumental in someone's life for the Lord Jesus Christ, try to show up occasionally. Be in their life still. Care about those you've discipled. Care about those who've discipled you. Nurture that concern with prayer, conversation, expressions of gratitude. You know the very best thing you can do for somebody who has been instrumental in your faith walk? Contact them and tell them you're still doing it, that you're still faithful. I, trust me, it means the world. When somebody working with you hears, I'm still at it, my hands to the plow. I'm working for the kingdom of God, and I'm being faithful where I'm at. Just what Paul heard from the Thessalonians. Lastly. Make encouragement and communication part of your daily discipline. Care unexpressed is powerless. It does nothing. Care unexpressed does nothing. Demonstrate concern by showing up in people's lives and by offering encouragement. Paul's so moved by the concern of the Thessalonian disciples that he just busts out with a blessing upon them. I love the way this, this chapter ends. Paul's just like so enthusiastic. He's like, ah, I'm going to bless you. So let's do this as we close up today. I want everybody to stand up. We got just one more thing after this, by the way. So stand up now and then we'll pray a blessing on you. Let's read this blessing together, shall we? Ready? It's on the screen behind me. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all the people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus 
with all his saints. Let's pray. Lord and God, thank you so much for, for Paul, for Timothy, for the church at Thessalonica, and the, the concern shared for one another in the midst of this passage. Father, I pray that we would be heavily invested in one another as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to care for other people in this room and for Christians who are near and far, those who are serving overseas, those who speak other languages, those who are yet to come into, into the faith. Lord, we love you. We praise you for all of this. In your name we pray, amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.